they leave behind really very touching stories. Hannah Ingram, for instance, was a young girl. Her father was a loyalist and he enlisted in the British Army. Her farm was ransacked. They took all the livestock and her four-year-old brother begged them not to take his pet lamb and they took it anyway because he was a traitor. The women who sought to leave and find refuge either in Canada or in the British forts or in New York were often prevented from doing so unless they agreed to pay an exit fine. That is, they had to pay to leave their homes and they had to pay all their expenses for the trip. Uh, sons over 12 in those families were required to stay behind and serve in the Revolutionary Army. So that was the cost. You could leave, but you had to leave behind any sons that you had who could uh, serve in the, in the military. Now the revolutionaries had a dilemma. Should they let these women and her children go? Because if they went and joined their husbands, that would lift the morale of the loyalists. Uh, and it was entirely possible that they would bring information that could be harmful to the revolutionaries. What the mood was in the town, how many men were armed, what kinds of supplies they had. So maybe we shouldn't let these women escape. Maybe we shouldn't let them go. On the other hand, if we kept them here and we've taken all their possessions, it's required of the community to support them. So do we want to support these women? Do we want to feed them and their children? or do we want to let them leave? Uh, one of the things that comes out of this is the communities have to grapple with the question of, are the women themselves traitors? That is, are these, do these women have political uh, loyalties themselves or are they simply the appendages of their husbands? And in many cases, they found out these women had political loyalties of their own. In a small town in New York, four women plotted to kidnap the mayor of the town uh, and hold him for ransom. So it's clear that they're acting on their own as loyalist participate, uh, participants. One of the things that happens when they do manage to get out of their hometown or their farming community or their little village is the trek to safety was, was harrowing sometimes 100, 150 miles on foot to try to get to a British-held fort or to try to get to Canada. Probably the worst part of it all was what happened after the war when all the loyalists were sent into exile. Some 15,000 people were loaded onto boats in Charleston and in New York and evacuated from, from what became the United States. The wealthier ones went to England where they had really uh, disturbing experience of having once been the elite in their community and now being nobodies in London. No matter how prosperous you were in Massachusetts, you were not a member of the nobility and so you were not very important. Plus, London was frightening to many of these women. I'll give you just one example. Jonathan Boucher from Maryland, who was a minister, a loyalist minister, uh, walked on the streets with his wife, Nellie Boucher, and she said, could we stop and, and wait until this crowd goes by? And Jonathan Boucher had to say to her, the crowd will never go by, my dear. This is just what London is like. Esther Sewell had the worst experience of all, I think, though when I was writing about her, it struck me as funny, which probably doesn't say something good about me. Her husband had a complete nervous breakdown. I, for real, he locked himself in his room for 18 months and passed notes out under the door, each one a little uh, less in touch with reality than the one before. During this 18 months, he came to the conclusion that his wife was responsible for the revolution. He never gave up that, uh, that theory. He lived for many years. They finally had to move to Canada. He lived for many years, and he tormented her daily with the fact that what had happened to him was entirely her fault. There's one really hilarious letter in which he writes, 
I wish my wife were tied to the tail of a comet and carried into space never to be seen again. Esther Sewell, being a very good wife and a, a, a devoted wife, never said a word. But five minutes after he died, she packed up all her possessions and moved back to Massachusetts to be with, uh, with friends and family. Most of the people who went to Canada were ordinary farmers, shopkeepers. They were not members of the elite. And here, uh, the shock for these loyalists was enormous. You have to realize many of them were many, many generations Americans. That is, they had lived in Massachusetts or South Carolina or Maryland for generations. The, their children had been born here. This, is, this was their home. And they were picked up and transported to a place they called Nova Scarcity. There was one woman who sat down uh, who had endured abuse from her neighbors, who had seen her farm destroyed, who had been brave through the whole thing, who had never cried. And as she watched, she wrote in a diary, as she watched the ships sail away, she sat down on Chapman Hill and she cried until she could cry no more because she knew she would never see her home again. And so when we talk about the great triumph of the American Revolution, I think we have to remember that for many people it was a tragedy. That is, for many people it was a being thrust out of their homes, being thrust away from their friends and their cousins and their brothers and sisters in some cases and sent to a place that was cold and dark and, and forbidding and not really anything like home. Well into the 1790s, you could see them riding home. I can still remember the taste of Massachusetts apples. I can still remember the smell of magnolias. That is, they really, really missed their home. The point about this, I think, to remember is that the American Revolution was a real civil war. More than the Civil War, what we call the Civil War, because there it was north against south. The American Revolution, Esther Sewell's sister, Dorothy, married John Hancock. That is, within the same family, within, among her brothers, the Quincy brothers, two were loyalists and one was a revolutionary. So that whole families were torn apart. People never saw their mothers and fathers again. Uh, it, it wasn't just, oh, those people over there. It was their own flesh and blood were, were now their enemy. And I think nothing drives this point home more than to see the diaries and letters of these loyalists who would write home to relatives and say, I, I, I still miss my home. I, I, I wish I could return. I wish I could go back. I wish this had never happened to me. Uh, and so you can't forget that the American Revolution was a tragedy for thousands and thousands of women and men.